um, the interesting span of um, topics and talks in real-time decision making. I'm going to talk about um, hybrid systems and um, uh, really maybe from an application-driven point of view, methods that we've been developing for decision making in hybrid systems um, based on both safety and performance. And I've been working for years on um, different kinds of safety critical systems. And I think it's really those um, applications that have um, uh, kind of pushed me into this direction of safe decision making. So the application that I've probably spent the most time on, and about 20 years now, is on air traffic systems. This is a snapshot of traffic, air traffic, across the um, well, Northern California. It's called the Oakland Center. So it's a region of airspace. It's controlled by um, a group of controllers. They're now um, uh, situated in Sacramento. So there's a building. The controllers get uh, radar information um, over, you know, of, of aircraft that are flying over their sectors of airspace. And each sector of airspace here, kind of outlined in these pink regions, has um, a single controller, and the, the goal of the controller is to make sure that the number of aircraft in that sector over any given period, um, you know, they, they stay safe, they, they go from their origin in the sector to their destination in their sector, and they don't come into um, a certain um, collision distance with each other. And, and for that reason, the system is organized so that the sector of airspace typically has no more than about 15 or 18 aircraft at any given time. And so you can see in this, the, in this picture the high level um, cross traffic going through and also the traffic that's actually coming in and merging. In this case, it's into San Francisco Airport. Okay, so it's a safety critical system. In fact, the separation distances are now probably, it's sort of historical, but with better radar equipment, those separation distances are now going down. But there's still five nautical mile lateral, lateral separation between aircraft and a thousand foot vertical separation required outside of, when you get close into San, close to San Francisco, they have much better radars, and of course the aircraft can come closer together. But if you're in regions um, a little bit further away from the airport, those are the current separation distances. So you can imagine these virtual hockey pucks around each aircraft, and the hockey pucks can't intersect each other. So I think maybe because it's such a safety critical system, and maybe historically the way the system has been designed, um, really starting after the Second World War um, in the Northeast Corridor and kind of developing across the United States. And, and I think because it's a, a very much a human-centered system, both in the context of air traffic controllers on the ground and pilots in the air, the system has developed with these standard routes, so standard corridors of well-traveled routes. And these are actually, you know, aircraft, they're the traces of aircraft, but they're following jetways between um, uh, navigation equipment, so between these omnidirectional range radars. <clears throat> And if you um, zoom in on some of these interesting intersections, so aircraft coming in, um, for example, and merging into a route that's going to come into San Francisco, and you watch how controllers tend to manage this traffic, they tend to group traffic um, together, or group aircraft together by potential conflict. So um, the first thing they try to do is line up aircraft along routes traveling all at the same speed so they can basically turn that group of aircraft into one aircraft because it's cognitively easier to manage that group of aircraft. Um, and they spend most of their time resolving conflicts in situations like this where you have aircraft that if they don't do anything like slow an aircraft down or speed an aircraft up or put it in a detour, then the aircraft will lose separation with each other. So there's kind of a constant monitoring of these intersection points and then kind of looking ahead and seeing what it, what's the next critical situation that can occur. So controllers tend to, air traffic controllers tend to control aircraft according to a kind of hybrid model of, I would say this is a hybrid model of an aircraft under air traffic control. They tend to keep aircraft for the most part in the speed on the route, the, on the route that the aircraft wants to fly at the speed that's optimal for the um, altitude that the aircraft is flying at. 
And then there's a small set of control actions that they'll tend to apply. So if they can speed it, if they can speed it up or slow it down by about 10% of that optimal velocity, they'll do it. If they speed it up or slow it down by more than that, then it's not um, really optimal flight for that density of aircraft at that altitude. And so to slow it down even more, they'll put them into detour, or to speed it up or slow it down, they'll put them into detours. So, um, so for example, they might just sort of cut the corner here for one of the aircraft or do a shortcut. Um, in the, the sort of worst case result, they'll put them into a holding pattern. And you typically see these holding patterns applied outside the, the busy, um, like the, the region around the urban airports. That's typically if you've been in holding patterns where you've been at, like circling over Marin outside the San Francisco Tracon is something that a lot of us have spent a lot of time doing. Okay, so, so it's a very interesting system. I've worked on it for a long time. It's a very slow-moving system. You can imagine slow-moving in the sense of adopting new technologies. Things have to be tested for a long time um, before they're allowed into this system. Um, but over the past five years, there's been quite a bit of excitement because of unmanned air vehicles. And the FAA has been trying to understand how to adapt the current air traffic management system to allow for these new operations that a lot of business and a lot of people just, you know, they want to fly their drones around. Um, and in particular, you know, large, large and sort of influential businesses have been putting pressure on the FAA to think about how to make it easier to fly a UAV through the national airspace system. Of course, they're flying at much lower altitudes, but, you know, aircraft do land and take off, and it's really important that there's no conflicts with UAVs in those areas. So, now it's kind of a clean slate, and it really is. I mean, it's interesting with NASA and looking at the, you know, the projects that they want um, people to work on. It's like we want a new, what they call UTM, Unmanned Air System Traffic Management System. So UTM instead of ATM, which is our usual air traffic management system. And we'd like to understand how to design it. And so in thinking about this, you know, in thinking about adopting some of the principles from the air traffic system, namely what they've done for safety, what they've done for simplicity when it's a human-centered system, it's, it's clear that some of that will be adopted into the new system. So for example, perhaps a root structure that is flexible, but it's still, you know, well organized. So if a human has to intervene, it's well understood what these groups of vehicles are doing. Uh, perhaps some kind of control structure um, on board the aircraft or some kind of understandable structure that if a human has to intervene, the, you know, they know what the vehicle is doing. Um, but these vehicles are autonomous, and so having the vehicle be kind of smart in the sense that it should be able to adapt to new information. Um, for example, one of the systems we're working on with NASA is a force landing system. They want to be able to force the vehicle to land um, if there's any problem. And there, you know, there, there's nobody in the vehicle, but the, the damage can be done to the surrounding environment. So understanding based on a fault that the vehicle has what the best place for that vehicle to land in given, you know, the current sense of the geography is a very important problem. Okay, so um, I'm going to present the, some of the tools that we've been developing um, in the context of this problem. And um, I've got really two points to make. One is about um, real-time computation. So we're talking about real-time decision-making. And some of the tools we've been developing are, are um, you know, they, they, they really, um, you know, they, they adhere to this curse of dimensionality. So what we've been doing in um, real-time computation for that. And then the, the kind of learning component, how we bring in the ability to adapt to new information yet still maintain the proof of safety is, is what we've been, really been interested in. So those, those will be the two topics that I'll focus on for the rest of the talk. We've been using the framework of hybrid systems. This is hybrid because it's combining two different kinds of modeling or two different kinds of models. Uh, finite state machine models or discrete state models, which are represented here by this uh, automaton. And then um, continuous state models um, represented here by, in this case, I've used a differential equation inside each discrete state. So the sense is that the system may have many different modes of operation, but in each mode of operation, there's a dynamic, which um, there's a model which is describing the, the physical evolution of the dynamics. And so, you know, in terms of that aircraft, um, 
the, the aircraft under air traffic control that we talked about. Um, there's you know, different modes depending on the control mode that the, um, the controller is using, whether it's going into a vector for spacing or a detour. But if you simplify the system that way, then the continuous dynamics in each mode are very simple. They're just linear dynamics. So that gives you a piecewise linear system, and that's easy to analyze. If you're looking at groups of aircraft, where this represents the, the composition of many different aircraft, now you know, the state would represent the composed state of a uh, discrete state mode of each of the aircraft, what, what um, collision avoidance mode they're in. And then the continuous dynamics would represent the joint continuous dynamics of, of the aircraft that you're looking at. OK, so here are the two parts. For the computation part, I'm going to talk about, or really the, the safety control, the first part. I'm going to talk about a tool we've been working on for years now, um, developing reachable sets for hybrid systems. I'll give an overview, and then I'll talk about some examples. And then for the second part, I'll end the talk by presenting, it, it's really our most recent work, in incorporating machine learning into these reachable sets, and, how, um, and what kinds of guarantees of safety you can make when you're doing machine learning, which is of interest to us because we'd like this kind of high performance. We'd like to design adaptive systems where we use data that's being collected, but we'd like to be able to, in as much as we can, maintain proofs of safety. So um, a backwards reachable set, it's quite an intuitive structure. Um, suppose that Suppose that you could, and, and I'm just plotting it here for some dynamic. It could be continuous. We'll show it could be hybrid. But suppose you have some continuous dynamics. X is your state space. You have a, a control input, a disturbance input. You can manipulate the control. You can't manipulate the disturbance. But suppose you know bounds on the disturbance. And so that dynamic is causing a system to evolve. Suppose that you could characterize, um, in this case, let's call it unsafety. So you could characterize unsafe states as some subset of the system state space. And that's what this red ellipse here, I've called it g at time 0. This, this set is meant to represent. It's the set of states that you don't want the system to get into. Um, well, suppose you could compute the backwards reachable set from that set of states. So that set is the, the set of states, the set of configurations of the system, for which um, under these dynamics, the flow of the system could enter that unsafe region. And, and because there's, um, you know, it could because there's um, possibility to control the system in a way that keeps it out of that set. But then you have to do that counter to whatever disturbances could be applied to the system. Usually in air traffic, those disturbances are not trying to drive you to unsafety, but there are disturbances. You don't know what they're going to do. So you, you want to be able to, for a proof of safety, you want to be able to prove it for the worst possible disturbance. OK, so this backwards reachable set is the set of all states for which, for all possible control actions, there is a disturbance which, under the dynamics of the system, could drive the state um, in, at most, t time units to that unsafe region. So that's, that's a definition. And, um, and, and the, the idea of control and disturbance, so pitting control against disturbance, leads us to this idea of, of, use, of describing it using game theory, that we're, we're, we're thinking about you know, the best possible control for the worst possible disturbance. So just to. So T is time. Yeah, but. Uh, and, and so. How do you determine that uh, set? that can reach G0, that, that depends on what time uh, scale you're looking at. So suppose you, um, you know, the, so we're, we're, going to, we're going to solve that differential equation for certain time horizons. And so really this, this little t here represents, um, you know, one of those time horizons. And that's practical, too, because, you know, you're usually solving collisions for the next two minutes or something. You've got some time horizon. After that, it may be too uncertain to be able to predict. So just to illustrate the point, and I don't really think I have to do this for this audience, but it's a nice little exercise to do before lunch. Um, the point is, uh, is well illustrated through this discrete game. It's, there's 10 states, so not, no continuous dynamics. It's just discrete. There's 10 states, Q1 up to Q10. And um, there's two players, player one. We'll call that the control, the good guy. And player two, uh, the disturbance or, or the bad guy. And then each player has two plays. Uh, 
and the plays are either one or two. So each arrow here um, representing transition from one state to another has an ordered pair representing the action of player one, the control, which plays first, and the action of player two, the disturbance. So the control plays first because we want to be conservative with respect to the control. So the disturbance has the advantage of seeing what the control has just played at every instant in time. Okay, and then the arrows represent the transitions, and then these little stars represent the wild card. It means for either, um, either play one or play two. So let's label our unsafe set. So G at time zero is, uh, I'll just label it as Q9 and Q10. So that's an assumption. I'm assuming in all of this that I can represent my specification as a subset of the state space of the system, in this case, safety or unsafety. And so the idea is, um, and I, you know, it's, it's dynamic programming. You, you look at the boundary of the unsafe set and you first ask which states, for which states on the boundary, meaning in this case in one transition, so one transition away, um, is there, um, do they have the property that for all possible control actions, there's a disturbance that could push the system into the unsafe set. And so we first look at the states on the boundary. So that means the states for which there is one transition. So Q4 is on the boundary. Q5 is on the boundary. Uh, Q8 is on the boundary. And so if you say, okay, what's the, in, in one step, what's the backwards reachable set from Q9 and Q10? You can just look at that and Okay, well, let's, let's do it. Um, is Q5 um, in the unsafe set? So does it have the property that for all possible control actions, a disturbance could push it into Q9 and Q10 in, in one step? It, it does, right? Because if, if the control plays one, you know, you could go to Q9, and if the control plays two, you could go to Q10. You can see this is a non-deterministic system just from the the way it's described. So in one step, Q5 should be um, you know, encompassed in the reachable set. What about Q4? The control, remember the control can play. The, the control gets to play first. So if you were in Q4 and you were the control, what would you do? You'd play one. But play, playing one, it keeps you in Q5, it takes you to Q5. Q5 is still not in the reachable set at that iteration. Or, or it could take you to Q1. So, so if, you, if you step back one step, um, the reachable set includes Q5 and Q8. So we call that G minus one because we're going backwards in time. And then you can continue. Now you label your new unsafe set as, the, as these four states and you just repeat that process. And so you find with this simple example that after two steps, you reach a fixed point. Namely, if, if you're in Q1, Q2, Q3, or Q7, there's always a control policy that can keep you outside of that reachable set forever. But but uh, that's not true for the states labeled in red. So that's the simple idea. Um, and so we, we worked on this for continuous systems. Um, so in, in here, the, um, the solution, so to be able to solve it for that continuous dynamics, it turns out that um, if you characterize the set, say the unsafe set, as the sub-level sets of a function. So I'll use this function j to represent the value in the game. And so j is less than zero inside the unsafe set and greater than zero outside. Then the, the reachable set um, becomes the sub-zero level sets of this function j as it propagates over time, where the propagation is governed by, um, it's, a, it's a modified Hamilton-Jacobi uh, Isaacs PDE. Okay, and, and there's some intuition here. You, you, if you look, sort of take our boundary argument again. So we, this, the left-hand side of the PDE describes the evolution of this function over time. And on the right-hand side, I have um, within this min with zero operation, a max over u, min over d. So the best possible control for the worst disturbance of the inner product of dj dx, that's just the outward pointing normal. So at any x at time t, that represents the outward pointing normal from the set. The inner product of that with the dynamics, the dynamics using that best control for the worst disturbance. So if the dynamics are such that at that state, for the best control for the worst disturbance, it's pushing you into that set, that state should be labeled as unsafe. Because you know whatever you do, you're gonna be pushed into the unsafe set. And so that means that that inner product, 
that a angle is obtuse, that becomes negative, the min was zero, that makes it negative, which means J propagates, J becomes negative at that point. And at the next step, it's included in the unsafe set. So there's, there's some intuition, you know, if we kind of look at the infinitesimal view of this PDE. Okay, so suppose we could compute this, then we could theoretically compute the reachable set. And so in my group, we've spent a lot of time computing these sets for real systems. Um, and we've been using this uh, level set interpretation. Um, so, so we use, as I said, um, a functional representation of sets, meaning that the sets that we start with, so this would be j of x at time zero, and then we're solving, as we solve for j of x t, what we're doing is we're capturing the sub-zero level sets of the evolution of that function. So this is meant to represent kind of a slice of jx t at a particular time horizon t. Okay, and there's a few points to make here which come back when we talk about learning. That um, it turns out that if that set is actually controlled invariant, so after a certain amount of time it stops growing, that means that if you stay outside that set you're guaranteed safety for all time. So if it's controlled invariant for all t, then any super zero level set of that, um, of that uh, set is also invariant and can be used for safety. So you, that makes sense. You can use an over approximation of that set or a, a super zero level set of that, of that set for safety. Um, that's important. And then also if you optimize, if you know a lot about your disturbance function, so you know you have a good model of your disturbance, then you, that set becomes um, less conservative. It becomes smaller in the sense of safety. Okay, so in particular, if the disturbance were known, then one could theoretically compute the optimal reachable set, the smallest one. And then that's really just, you know, the, the, there's no disturbance acting, but the, this is just based on the dynamics of the system. Your dynamics, you can't turn away from that unsafe set fast enough. So it, it effectively partitions the state space into um, what is either safe or could become unsafe, and you can't prove that it can't become unsafe, uh, what's safe, and then the boundary. And on the boundary, the technique gives you the best control law to apply so that you stay on the boundary or you're pushed back into safety. Okay, so we use these, um, these level set functions. Um, you know, this is just an example. It, one of my first PhD students, um, he's now a professor in CS at UBC, um, coded this up into a level set toolbox and it's available from his website with a bunch of examples. He came, um, he was a PhD student, I was a professor at Stanford before, so he graduated from Stanford and then he came to do a postdoc working with Praveen um, and, and looking at these ideas in robot planning. Okay, so here's an example. Here's four quad rotors. Um, this was actually, we, we did this when I was back at Stanford. So we call, and we st even though we've moved to Berkeley, we still call this the Starmac testbed because Barmac doesn't sound as good as Starmac. So the Stanford testbed of autonomous rotorcraft. This was before you could buy a quad rotor on every street corner. So we built, um, well, if you see them up close, we built our own. I was kind of proud of those. They're in our lab, kind of in a museum. Um, but uh, there are four quad rotors and there are four students. And so here you see the data being played back. Around each quad rotor, you see three sets that are growing and changing as the relative configurations of the vehicles change. And in regular flight, when they're not touching each other's reachable sets, the students are controlling them through joystick. And the students are actually trying to get them to collide. Um, and what, we've, what, what the algorithm is that's programmed into these quad rotors is um, this collision avoidance using reachable sets. So as soon as one of the vehicles comes on the boundary of the reachable set of another, the automation will take over and will guide the aircraft away from each other. Okay, so it's an awful human computer interface example. It's more like a demonstration of how you might um, use, how, how you might apply this collision avoidance in real time. <laughs> All right, now these, um, these systems, uh, I'll talk a little bit about this, but the, we can decompose the dynamics, and so we can actually solve that Hamilton-Jacobi-Bellman equation in real time, which you can't do in general. So that, that's sort of the important thing for this workshop. Okay, and, and again, you can turn this problem around. Suppose you have a desired set of states you'd like to capture. Um, the problem becomes really the same thing. Now it's instead of a max over u min over d, it's a min over u max over d. And so here's the set of states for which you can guarantee that the system will reach the desired set 
um, despite the worst possible disturbance that could be pushing it away from the desired set. And when I say guarantee here, it's in the sense that guarantee if we trust the models that we're using of the system, so in the sense of model checking. Okay, and then to the point of hybrid systems, you can sequence these operations. So suppose you have a target set that you'd like to reach. You could compute the, the backwards reachable set of that target set, and then you're, you're switching modes, so you can compute from some subset of that backwards reachable set, you could compute another backwards reachable set, and basically compute kind of the back chain of operations that you would need to apply to get to this target set. And you can combine that with avoiding unsafe sets. So we have this, in this toolbox that I talked about, we have this operator called a reach avoid operator. The set of states which can reach a desired set while avoiding unsafe sets. And, and the operation, because you're using level set functions, it's basically masking. You can use these operations of um, unions and intersections of sets. Do you, reach, do you do these things numerically or analytically? Yeah, we solve them numerically. So we, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but we use, um, well, we use level set methods to solve for these sets. And if you don't do any kind of logical um, decomposition of sets, you can solve, you know, you, just using a laptop computer, you can solve for three continuous state dimensions in real time. When I say real time, I mean like for the processors of these aircraft. Okay, so there's a community of people working in reachability. A lot of people are coming from the control community. And, um, and, and as you can imagine, the biggest problem in computing these sets is dealing with you know, the computation and the representation of these sets, well, the, 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 the storage of these sets in, in higher dimensions. So three states is not enough to represent a group of aircraft because you want the composition of, the, of the, all aircraft in that group. So the state becomes big as you include more aircraft. And so we've, over the, the different, um, uh, the, I mean, there's, there's a community of people working on it, and I've sort of divided these, these um, issues of dealing with the curse of dimensionality, so the methods people are using, into these four different arenas. So you can impose um, practical constraints on the problem, which I think is what like 99% of people working on practical problems do. Um, you actually, even in air traffic, you know, you don't solve the collision avoidance problem for all 12 aircraft in your sector. You group it down to really those two or three aircraft that are coming down that are going to intersect at the intersections. Um, a lot of work on approximations. Um, uh, a lot of work on looking at the mathematical structure of the system and also decomposition. So let me talk about a few of these. Um, one problem, which is really relevant for UTM, as I defined it, is imposing practical constraints on the problem. So let's start with that. Okay, so this is example two. I call it platooning UAVs. Platooning comes from Praveen. Um, back when I was a graduate student, he was working on the, um, the automated highway system and proposing the use of platoons of cars on the inner lane of California's highways, and now even at, at traffic lights, as we saw in his talk uh, the other day. So here, um, this is just an example where, so, you know, suppose you have your Amazon warehouse in Concord, and these are um, sending out, you know, you want your iPhone in the next 30 minutes, so you're going to call, you're going to pay the premium to get your iPhone. And so these quad rotors, or whatever Amazon is using, are going to fly to, you know, locations in the Bay Area. Well, if you put a cost map, so this comes to this, back to this forced landing system. So water is cheap, because if it lands in the water, it's not a big deal. The highly populated city areas are expensive. Airports are really expensive, or regions around airports. Um, you know, the parks and the forested areas are relatively cheap, but not as cheap as water. So given that cost map, you can solve, and this is just um, you know, a fast marching method for the shortest path between that warehouse and main drop-off points in the Bay Area. And you see the emergence of, so all we did was we solved uh, fast marching, and you see the emergence of these trunk routes. So these kinds of highways in the sky that exist already in the ATM system. So, you know, um, well-populated or well-traveled highways and then short deviations into the expensive regions, which is what you would expect. 
So with that, we went ahead and thought about a hybrid model for a UAV under this, in, in this kind of platoon, or, or, or in this kind of um, highway structure. And we thought about the idea of using platoons of UAVs. So UAVs flying at the same speed along these highway routes and then you know, deviating or, or coming into a highway, merging into a platoon, um, and then deviating off when they needed to drop off their package or perform whatever operation they're performing, bridge inspection, et cetera. And so um, this is a simplified version of it. But basically, if the vehicle is not on a highway, it's free. If it, um, if it joins a highway, it can either join a platoon or be the leader of a platoon. So if it's on its own, it's the leader of its own platoon. And then these, pl these highways are at altitude. So if there's a, a vehicle that's faulty, you can use altitude as your, as your safety net. So get it to descend and out of the arena of the traffic. Um, so these transitions, um, you know, leaving highway, or this is kind of the self-loop, creating a new platoon, joining a platoon, those transitions are important. And those we want to compute, we, want, no, we don't want to prescribe those, we want the actual guards for those transitions to come out of the reachability computations for both reaching desired targets, reaching points on the highway within a platoon, as well as avoiding collision with other UAVs around. And so we used reachability analysis to do that. Here's, uh, I'm going to illustrate it through examples. Um, but here's two vehicles, a red vehicle and a blue vehicle. This is the highway. This is the desired point that the, um, that the red vehicle is, wants to join on the highway and become its own platoon. And this represents its target set. So once it gets into this set here, there's a control law which will snap it onto the highway. Or it's, you know, we define that control law ahead of time. So there's some, we, we basically you know, use standard control laws once it becomes so close to the highway that it becomes a simple control problem. At the same time, there's another vehicle in the vicinity, the blue vehicle, that it wants to avoid. So this red set represents the unsafe set of the, of the red vehicle with respect to the blue vehicle. That means that the red vehicle shouldn't enter this um, red set given the relative dynamics of those two vehicles, or they could come into collision. So it's basically what we talked about before. Um, and so you can see, you know, the progression, it gets into its target set, the blue vehicle is coming in. Now the bottom row represents the action of the blue vehicle also wanting to come in and join the highway. It's going to um, form a, it's going to follow the platoon created by this red vehicle. And so now it wants to get into this blue region while avoiding this uh, dashed blue region. So this represents the reach avoid set for the blue vehicle. And, and so if you do this with all of the vehicles, it automatically computes the control strategies to get these platoons to form. So we're not plotting the sets here because it comes messy. You have to compute the sets of each vehicle with respect to the other vehicles in the vicinity. Uh, but you see this kind of organic uh, formation of these platoons. Um, so once they're in the platoon, the vehicles really only have to care about the vehicle in front of it and the vehicle behind it. So this is where we're imposing practical constraints on the problem. You're, you don't have every vehicle worrying about every other vehicle. It just turns it into you know, a, a, a vehicle in front and a vehicle behind. And, um, and you can also account for things like intruders. So there's a vehicle that doesn't follow any of the rules and it just flies straight through. As soon as these vehicles um, are, you know, they're touched by the reachable set, the unsafe set of the red vehicle, they break from the highway, they break from the platoon, and then they join again once that danger is over. So those are, those are like basically automatic computations of the guards of that, of that highway, um, the platooning vehicle. Okay, other methods um, for dealing with the curse of dimensionality. We talked about imposing practical constraints like you know, roads, highways, or protocols. Um, approximation, so we've been working recently on something which we call decoupling disturbances. And it really comes into you know, the dynamics of the, the differential equations here. So if you have the situation, and I'm just gonna show a, a picture um, here, where this is, a, this is a, a reachable set for a four-dimensional vehicle, um, x, y position, velocity, and the, rel the heading of the vehicle. Um, you, can, um, you can look at the structure of the differential equation, and you can break it down into subsystems using where each subsystem can essentially be treated as an independent system for reachability constraints. That's nice, because it reduces the dimension of those individual problems. 
Um, yeah, there's typically coupling. I mean, it started from one set of differential equations. Any coupling variables we consider as disturbances with respect to both systems. And so, and, and you can, you can um, look at the degree of the way you model the disturbances. And as you model the disturbances with more and more fidelity, you get better and better approximations, as shown by these gray regions, which are over approximations to the actual reachable set, which are shown in green. Okay, but it turns a four-dimensional computation into two two-dimensional computations, which seems, you know, that that's good in theory, but where it becomes really useful, and let me just sort of skip ahead to some examples. I don't think I'm going to go through all the details of the decoupling, but, you know, it comes into... Um, a handy. So suppose we have a six-dimensional system. Using these ideas of decoupling, we can turn that into two two-dimensional systems. Or more interestingly, something that we've been working on for um, some of the demonstrations you'll see at the end of the talk. Uh, here we have a ten-dimensional model of a quadrotor in call it near hover conditions. By doing this kind of decomposition, we've actually created um, two three-dimensional subsystems and one one-dimensional subsystem. So these become very easy real-time computations that can be done. And then you use that. So basically, you're computing the reachability operations in each of the subsystems and then creating the um, exact, in this case, reachable set for the 10D system. Okay, so this is very current work. We have a paper in this year's, um, well, we had a paper in last year's CDC, and we've submitted this latest work to the, the current CDC. Okay, question. Is there any geometric interpretation of this decomposition of the substance? That's a really good question. So the question is, the, is there a, a geometric interpretation of the way we can think about this? Um, I, I think so. So what we have a condition. We, we know um, under what conditions we can apply this. It has to do with um, um, if you have a coupling variable like a control input that couples between two subsystems. And if the, if the, the action that you need from that control variable for one subsystem is conflicting with the action that you need for that, from that control variable with the other one, then this isn't going to work. So what we want to, what we're doing is characterizing, and we haven't got a complete characterization, but for which, for what systems that actually doesn't occur so that you can use this decoupling. And there are some interesting systems that we use in the lab, and the, I mean these quadrotor systems, we, we can show that that works. But a general result we don't have yet, so this is something that we're working on. And I think you know, it definitely has to do with the differential geometry of the system. Okay, so, so now let's go into the second part of the talk, um, which I'll really conclude on. So I'll just show some examples, really, where we're trying to um, take these ideas of reachable sets for safety and make them more flexible. So to make them more flexible, two different things. Um, incorporating high performance control within these reachable sets. And then using these ideas of if you're learning more and more about the system over time, you're learning more and more about the environment, the disturbance functions acting on the system. So how would you actually update the reachable sets over time? If you start to trust your model that you're learning, then maybe it's a good idea to become less conservative and update your reachable sets. All right, so, um, and this is implicable, th this project that we're working on with NASA on forced landing systems, um, this is well, a shot of the Berkeley campus, um, and this presents kind of the cost map um, if you were forced to land a, a quadrotor right now on the Berkeley campus. You'd have, um, you know, pictures of where the pathways are, maybe buildings you don't want to land on, grass is good. But as you start to get close, the sensors pick up, you know, movement in these areas, and then they become regions that you don't want to land on. So you need to be able to adapt um, and incorporate real-time information that you're gathering over time. All right, so, so really, you know, what we talked about for reachability, that was focusing on safety and simplicity. So safety from reachability, simplicity from that hybrid model. Um, and then learning dynamic behavior safely is, is trying to address this um, data-driven or ability to adapt to new information. <coughs> Okay, so at Berkeley these days, um, there's a big effort in um, AI machine learning, but not only that, it's, it's deep learning. So that's what, you know, everybody in my department that's working on robotics is working on deep learning, uh, which means that you're using a neural network for um, learning. And it's, it's been used amazingly um, beautifully in computer vision, and now there's more and more 
focus on using it in robotics. Okay, so we, we thought, well, just to motivate, you know, uh, data-driven, incorporating data-driven, we just did this experiment um, in, in the past couple of months. But this is our little, this is one of our littlest quad rotors, these little um, crazy flies. And we taught it two things. We, um, we taught it to follow a sinusoidal track. Um, so that was one neural net. And then we also taught it to yaw, so to basically stay in place and turn in circles, which it turns out is amazingly difficult, or surprisingly difficult for the quad rotor to do. Well, it's basically because you have to be very careful about the frame of reference. It's yawing around. Um, and then we just asked it to fly a trajectory, which combined those two things. So basically now it's tracking that trajectory while it's turning in circles. And, um, and you know, it, it, it didn't do as well as our LQR, but that's because we're control people, we're not deep learning people, so we're still learning how to do it properly. But we got, you could see, a fairly good result just by using like a, this is a two-layer rectified linear unit neural net. Okay, so that's just my slide to say, you know, there's, there's some interesting things in using neural nets for control. And we did this a long time. I mean, this was done a long time ago. Well, not a long time ago, but in, um, I, I, when I was at Stanford, I became good friends with Bernie Woodrow, and he did a lot of this work in using AI or, or using neural nets in control. And, um, but I think, you know, just because of our ability to do these computations much faster, it's becoming something that's possible now. The neural net is continually feeding control signals into this. Thing. Yes, and we're using the error between actual between desired and actual to update the neural net. Could you just say a bit about what the training set was? Are you, are you training it in a simulation, or are you training? No, we're training it. We and that's a good idea. We didn't do that, and we realized that we should do quite a bit of that. We're training it by um, doing lots and lots of runs of that figure eight back and forth and back and forth, and that's the data. That's one of the reasons it's not doing as well as the LQR because we just don't have enough data to be able to get something at such high fidelity yet. So when you're training it, what, what's the input and what's the output and what are you? What, what are you actually doing to the thing for this training? We're, um, so the, we have a, a desired trajectory. It knows what its desired trajectory is. And we're measuring the, the distance between, we're measuring what, it's apply, what control inputs it's applying and the distance between what it does and the actual desired trajectory. And those are the inputs. That, that's what we're using as training inputs. But, I mean, what we're all wondering is why it doesn't crash while you're learning? So you have. A lot, you put a lot of structure in the control, I guess. We have a lot of structure in the control. So it's, um, you know, the, the, the vehicle is uh, using a fairly good model of itself, and it's trying to learn a better model. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, we're not doing any safety nets in this at all, but we are, you know, we're using a safety net, which is that the vehicle has a fairly good model of itself to start out with. That's well, like the AlphaGo, they had to bootstrap that by watching experts play, and then it, it, it taught itself from... Right, so our, our um, I guess our bootstrapping is having some nominal model, which we know, you know, is a is, is going to get the vehicle to track the trajectory, albeit not very well. In fact, um, you know, our performance is not only tracking the trajectory well, it's doing those figure eights very quickly. So the LQR, as I keep saying, was able to do it much faster than the neural net, but it's because we didn't have enough data to train it. Okay, so we want to learn models of data, but now, uh, sorry, we want to learn models from data, but we want to, or, or learn better models from data, but we want to stay safe while learning. And so the first thing we did, we've, we've taken a couple of steps in this direction, apart from just that um, visual of the neural net control, is um, we decoupled those two problems. So um, if we have a nominal model of our system with error bounds, uh, we, we don't know what the error is, that's what we'd like to learn, but we know what the bounds are. Then we can compute a reachable set based on the worst case error. And then that becomes a conservative reachable set for the system. And then within that reachable set, we can pr perform um, you know, whatever learning scheme we want for high performance. So to visualize this, this is, a, um, this is our quad rotor in our lab. Uh, we took a nominal model of that with error bounds, and we computed a safe region of operation inside this room. So in this case, there's only one vehicle, and we're going to ask it to track a trajectory where it's basically just 
performing a step function, up and down, up and down in altitude. And safety means it doesn't crash into the ceiling or the floor. So that's the, so the safety envelope represents, you know, when it has to start slowing down so it doesn't crash into the floor or the ceiling as it's going up. So we used the model to compute the safety envelope, and then we took the model away from the vehicle and we asked it to learn how to track that trajectory. So it's somewhat artificial in that we used a model to compute the envelope, and then to demonstrate learning, we took the model away. And the learning that we're using is something that's quite simple. It's this policy gradient sign derivative um, uh, that Zico, Coulter, and Andrew Eng designed. So the first thing that happens when you apply this scheme is the, the vehicle first drops because it doesn't have a model of itself. It doesn't have a control. Um, but it doesn't crash because it hits the boundary of the safe envelope. And then it just, um, it just sort of hangs out near the bottom of that envelope, but it, it sort of bounces up and down a bit. And in bouncing up and down, it, it learns that if it applies a certain thrust, it goes up. And it knows it has to track this step trajectory, which is shown in blue. And so after about a minute using this scheme, it does a fairly good job of tracking that trajectory. Okay, so it's a bit of an artificial example, but it demonstrates that, you know, you can teach it to track a trajectory while it's, um, while it's without crashing. Okay, so it's not really learning to fly from scratch because we gave it the envelope that it had to stay within. And, you know, with the envelope comes the control it has to apply on the envelope from reachability. Um, okay, so, so then we started to um, make it a little more sophisticated and say, well, if we're going to be learning these disturbance functions or these errors over time, we could perhaps use that in updating the envelopes. And so we've, we've been using Gaussian process models for our disturbance function. So these are Gaussian distributions over functions. Um, and, uh, and so as, we're, as the vehicle is flying, we're basically getting data points of, you know, as you apply this control, how it moved over the range of um, either the state space itself or some subregion of the state space that it tends to fly in a lot. And that allows you, those data points allow you to update this disturbance function. Okay, so, so then, um, so the idea is then this, and this comes back to some of the very earliest slides. Um, if you've got, you know, a, a time invariant, um, uh, if you've got a controlled invariant reachable set, then any super zero level set is uh, also controlled invariant. So then as the vehicle's flying and it, it's always, um, you know, it's, it's getting data and then it's asking whether or not this data matches the model that it has of the disturbances. And if it, if it's, uh, it, at any point in the state space, if it doesn't match, or if it doesn't match in a way that indicates that it's not being conservative enough, it will scale back and say, okay, I'm not going to, I, it's, it's, it's doing, I'm, I'm gathering data that I'm not expecting, so I'm gonna expand my reachable set using some super zero level set. And actually at that point, that was the first point at which it, uh, it, it didn't validate its own model, so it chose the level set at that particular point and uses that for its, its reachable set. So this is a case of it becoming more conservative. And then as it gets more and more data, and, um, and now is the sort of the control question is, how do you then reconcile, how much data do you need to get before you trust your model enough to be able to shrink these sets? How is that initial trajectory generated? The this, is, um, this, this initial trajectory is, it could be done in a clever way. Um, right now, we're just assuming that it's some trajectory you're asking the vehicle to fly. So it may be that trajectory, you know, just follow a trajectory. And, and so it's something that it's doing, um, you know, in general, it could be some other objective that the vehicle wants to follow apart from safety. But if you knew that you were trying to query something about safety, you would choose better trajectories for this. Is that some arbitrary trajectory that's Right now, let's consider it some arbitrary trajectory. And so um, over time, as you get more information, you could actually you know, make this, this less conservative. And so I'll skip the safe learning. I'll go actually to an experiment to conclude with. So that just shows how we would do this. But this is a recent experiment we did um, with a single experiment with our quad rotor. Again, a similar experiment to the one I just showed. Uh, but we ran the experiment twice. And uh, this is one experiment, and that's the second experiment. Um, in this case, we're using learning. So we're using that online validation, and in this case, we're not. 
Um, and there's a fan here, a fairly strong fan, uh, but it's initially switched off. So the vehicles are slowly you know, um, going up and nothing, nothing different from what we did before. But the fan, when it's switched on, provides a state-dependent disturbance. So it basically you know, upsets the model that it has about itself in this lower region of the room. Okay, so it's, um, it's, it's flying within its reachable set without the disturbance. It's got uh, that safety prevents it from going into the ground. But now, um, in both cases, the model is inaccurate because the fan is switched on. In this case, we don't have any learning. And in this case, we do have learning. And it, it does what you would expect. So up here, there's not really any disturbance. So the vehicles are just flying as, as normal. But then as you see them come down to um, where the fan is, and the fan really buffets them away, so you can see that. Um, so in this case, there's no online validation. In this case, we see so no learning. In this case, there is learning. And you see the, well, you don't see, but what's happening here is the safe set is contracted. It's basically doing that thing where it says, my, the, model that I'm, I, the model that I have of the vehicle in this region is not um, accurate. It's not behaving as I expected the model to. And so it's simply, you know, it's quite obvious what it would do, but the mathematics behind it is it's contracting the reachable set so that it's, it's allowing a reduced safe region for the vehicle to fly in. Okay, whereas this one is just, it's, you know, it's trying to tra track that trajectory and it, it can't do it there. All right, so um, I'll skip the up, uh, local updates and just conclude now. Um, okay, so we've been working on reachability analysis for safety, um, hybrid system representation for simplicity. So taking a complex system and breaking it into a number of modes and using that to simplify the control of the system. And then really we've been focusing in the last, I would say four or five years in incorporating um, learning schemes into this and trying to think about maybe more philosophically how to blend learning with safety-based control. Um, some of the big questions, so we uh, alluded to this, in a safety critical scenario, how do you update these reachable sets? Um, you know, that's kind of, a, I think it's almost a philosophical question because it, uh, it depends on when you trust your model enough to be able to um, you know, update what you mean by safe. And, and a lot of this is assuming that we're going to have access to lots of data, and we do have access to lots of data, as most of the other talks in this workshop have attested to. I think one of the most interesting questions which came up a number of times this week is, um, is the data. How, how do we, what, when we're looking at self-driving cars and you know, the company's recording every driver that's driving their car, who, who really owns that data or who should own that data in the future if it's a healthcare system? You know, all, all these questions on platform-based systems that you know, presumably we're going to be using learning in a much more integrative way and control. Um, and then the, the, the reason I really got into this is because I'm interested in, in autonomy where it's, it's really human-centered automation. And you know, human functionality with these systems is very difficult to model. Um, and that's a, a prime area where you could use learning very effectively. Okay, so that's, that's one of the areas that I'm interested in. And we've worked on apps to get you know, information from people's behaviors and auto land functions with Boeing. We have a setup of capture the flag on campus here with students and quad rotors team together. Um, and then we've worked a lot with these um, you know, air traffic data sets to try to you know, learn uh, models of different kinds of air traffic controllers. Okay, so with that, I'd like to conclude and thank um, uh, the students who've worked, uh, so the students in bold are the students who are currently working with me. Um, about half of those are working on these projects. And then students who've worked on these problems but have recently graduated and are at other places, um, and then our funding agencies. Thank you very much. Is there any relationship between reachability and approachability, as in like the black holes approachability theorem? What's the question? Is there a relationship between approachability, like black holes approachability theorem, so that's like a vector two person zero sum game, but the vector version of that, and you say like, can I approach a convex set or not? And it's like, if and only if there's like a condition on the projection onto the convex set. It seems like similar. Yeah, I. Mean, I, I I would say yes, but I, I'd have to learn more about the concept of approachability before um, 
before confirming that. that a lot of the examples and the early examples in reachability are from you know two person zero sum games and um, and, uh, and and you know the, trying to not only characterize but but compute um, you know before they before using viscosity solutions of PDEs they were actually computing the characteristics of these games and using those as the boundaries of the reachable set so I imagine yes but without going and studying it I, uh, I and I will that's a, a good lead. Any other questions? When, when an agent discovers that its model is wrong, it has to go and learn to update its model. So it has to start by discarding some of its prior beliefs. How, how in, uh, is there any way to think about how much of its prior beliefs it needs to discard? I presume it doesn't start from scratch. That, that, that I think, is the, the interesting question. To and, and, and maybe it's that's the way to start approaching this um, this point about how much of the original model um, are you are you going to maintain. So with what we've done so far, that part is fairly obvious because we we have a model um, and we model the disturbance as some you know function that's affecting our differential equations. And so that's the part that's unknown, and we're either getting a good model or not. So we can always you know go back to our old model if we want to. But in actual fact, you know, when we're modeling things like you know, autonomous cars, with, where the, the big deal is to try to model effectively what the environment is, and the environment are people crossing roads, and there's different kinds of people, and people who stop in the middle and turn around and go back, how, how, to, how to really you know, parse out those components of the environment and, ter and, and understand what, what, is, what is something that you, you, you're sure about and, and what part you're uncertain about, I think that's, that's quite interesting and that's really the direction to go. So I, I don't know. So it seems like there are two kinds of conditions. The one is to avoid the unsafe things in the squad rotor tracking the up and down movement, but the other is the kind of a liveness type thing where you can't just fly flat. You have to try to get to the peaks and valleys that you indicate. Oh, right. So how do you sort of, do you have a Lagrangian that uh, we optimize some kind of combination of these two? What we do is we, um, we, we really separate it into liveness and safety. So as long as it's satisfying the safety constraints, it will attempt to um, minimize error on achieving the liveness, the liveness condition. So in the up and down case, that's just, that's just coded as you know. You want to stay as close as possible to that trajectory. In the UTM case, those um, target sets are liveness conditions. So as long as you're, you, you want to get to the reach avoid set. So that's the set of states where you can reach. That's the liveness part while avoiding the unsafe condition. So avoid is always always has to be satisfied. And it will it will put it will put precedent of, of, over avoid, like it will make avoid more important than reach. You could change that, but that's that's how we're currently doing it for safety. Okay, thanks very much.